You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. In today's episode, John is joined by Dan Hendricks. Dan Hendricks received his PhD from UC Berkeley. He's currently the director of the Center for AI Safety. The Center for AI Safety is a San Francisco-based research and field-building nonprofit. Their mission is to reduce societal scale risks associated with artificial intelligence by advancing safety research, building the field of AI safety researchers, and promoting safety standards. Dan Hendricks, welcome to the program. Hi, glad to be here. Now, you work in a field that is growing increasingly concerning, and that is the safety of our dalliances with artificial intelligence, which are in some areas is getting a little bit disconcerting, at least to me. What do you think the state of artificial intelligence is right now? And should people be worried that maybe we need to slow down and start talking about this stuff before we push further and further? So I think it's rapidly progressing and a lot of people's predictions as to where we would be and how long things will take have been systematically shown to be wrong. So many professors would say it'll be another 200 years until we have AIs that can program at the level of an introductory college student. And that's not the case anymore. So we're about 200 years ahead of schedule there. Since there's a lot of uncertainty in AI's development, I think it's important to extend our uncertainty outward into the future, but also forward. So uncertainty just doesn't push back the time estimates of when powerful AI arrives. It should also make us consider the possibility that things could arrive more quickly than expected. I think generally things have been arriving more quickly than expected, and a lot of people who are developing advanced or more advanced AI systems are thinking that we could have something like human level AI in some would say this year, others might say two to three years. There's certainly people who think it would take substantially longer than that, but many of the people working in industry, training these models on 10,000 plus GPUs and things at that scale often think that it's actually fairly fairly soon. Now, what did we get wrong? Now, I will fully admit that I was wrong because I expected us to take a good 20 or 30 more years to get where we are right now than what actually happened. It happened much faster. And even just a decade ago, people were saying, well, computers, and it's not even as smart as a cockroach or something like that. Mm -hmm. Well, we sort of blew past that, it seems. (laughs) And we did it at breakneck speed. And for a lot of people, it came out of nowhere. So what was the was the hang up? What was the problem that that caused everybody to predict wrong? So one thing is that we don't understand intelligence that well. So they can do many things that are very impressive and things that we think are difficult actually can be a lot easy and things that we think are easy can be very difficult. For example, chess is something that generally is quite hard for humans. Meanwhile, recognizing images is something that comes naturally to us and we're extremely capable at it by two years of age. So we can see that the rules of thumb that we use to estimate the difficulty of tasks don't necessarily apply for AI systems. So I think that's one thing, and that's what will keep creating a lot of uncertainty in the future as well. Maybe some types of cognitive tasks will actually just turn out to be far easier than we would expect. That could possibly even be something like research. Maybe there just is more creativity needed for research. If you have a command of a literature, and then if you need to be very creative, maybe these AIs could actually be very creative, and then that might make them good at research. So even things like my own profession could potentially, (laughs) we could get a a very rude wake-up call very shortly. Another thing is that the machine learning community used to or has gone through AI winters. So that's made them systematically downplay progress in AI because many decades ago, when AI got more hyped, then after the hype fizzled, then they started being defunded. So they've been very afraid of hype and they've been afraid of saying that actually these are fairly capable and they are concerning. So consequently, many of our experts for many years were, well, this isn't true understanding. It doesn't really know what's going on. And, and they, would, they would come with various reasons for dismissing it. I think also that the technology just wasn't easily accessible to the public. So 
I think many of the impressive things that GPT-4 can do, we saw that in a much weaker form with models before even GPT-3. But when it became much more accessible to people, then it became a lot more obvious that they're fairly capable. So those are, those are some factors. One other factor could be that many of the capabilities are spontaneously emergent, which we didn't expect. So if we keep scaling these models, training them on more data and throwing more computational resources at them, they just happen to learn many different capabilities that we didn't intend for them to learn. So they'll learn to teach themselves arithmetic, but then they'll also learn to teach themselves about law and how to analyze or do medical diagnoses in many different contexts. So we didn't program for them to do that. All we did was point to them at a big blob of data, had them do unsupervised learning on that data, then out comes various different capabilities. So that's also another thing that contributed to a lot of surprise is how much it just ended up picking up by itself. So it's, it's a mixture of factors. There are incentives for, there are historical incentives for not wanting to sound weird. I think in physics, it's somewhat different. People talk about various orders of magnitude and they'll talk about space colonization and it's, it's perfectly acceptable in that community. But sounding weird in, in AI has been more troublesome because it led to significant defunding. That's interesting, that, that thought, that maybe we instead of overestimating the artificial intelligence, we actually overestimated the human. And we didn't really realize that we might not have been as complicated as, <laughs> as we thought. And there you get into hubris that would say, oh, AI will never get to any sort of level of human generalized artificial intelligence, you know, human level. Do you see that happening very quickly? Do you think that we're going to see something that looks and acts indistinguishable from a human soon? Yeah, I think that the hubris part is, I think there's possibly a large systematic bias for people thinking that they're, especially more intelligent people, their livelihood and their identity is staked on how intelligent they are relative to others. But if it so happens that an AI can read almost the entire internet fairly quickly and learn from the whole thing, then many different skills that people pick up over many years are potentially something that the AI would acquire very quickly. I think it is plausible that we could have a human level AI this decade. I think that now I should say, it's not the case that it will necessarily be human level AI in all different respects. So I don't think that's the thing to look for. I think the thing to keep track of are what are the relevant capabilities that make it potentially hazardous? So that would be things like long-term planning or hacking or the ability to deceive and manipulate. That's actually, I think, much more relevant. So I wouldn't be surprised if in 2026 we have a superhuman mathematician research bot that is more capable of researcher in mathematics than Terry Tao, but at the same time, we don't have autonomous vehicles that can reliably drive around. So not all of these capabilities are correlated. Some can progress much more quickly than others. And so we might have AI systems that are actually very capable and can cause a lot of harm, but still are dumb in a few respects. I think that's uh, so I think even later this decade, they may have a few faults, but they could vastly outpace us in many domains that are relevant for our employment. So let's take the physicists and say, OK, there I can't see any reason why a computer wouldn't make for a better cosmologist than a human cosmologist does. In other words, if you want to figure out the universe, maybe you should ask the AI. So in a task like that, it seems like super intelligence is almost here and that scientific papers will be authored by AI soon. Is that am I overstepping, you know, where we're at here with well, there are some papers or some scientific advancements, such as, say, AlphaFold, which may end up getting the Nobel Prize. So uh, an AI doing the heavy lifting to get a Nobel Prize may not be too out of the question. Now, of course, many humans were involved in that process. I, I think it can vary depending on the research area. For example, in machine learning, what happens is we often need to do a lot of tinkering and it's kind of random and there's a lot of throwing a lot of stuff at the wall and seeing what sticks. I don't see why an AI couldn't do that much more efficiently. Right now, it's still somewhat hard to have it perform those various sorts of actions, but maybe later it could, and then it could potentially automate that type of machine learning research. 
There's other bits of machine learning research, like trying to get the computer systems to be substantially more efficient so that we can train larger models. Now that's a programming, but that requires a lot more programming. And that might take somewhat longer depending on how much code it has to learn from and to imitate so that it could replace programmers doing that very specialized type of coding. Maybe that'd be easy, maybe that'd be especially hard. So I, I think it could vary quite a bit. We might find some different fields have the research a lot easier to dispense with than others. I mean, I suppose two years ago, we created a benchmark where we looked at the performance across 57 different academic exams. So we could look at the GRE physics exam, the GRE biology exam. These are exams that undergraduates in those fields take to get admitted to PhD programs. And what we found is that some subjects are much harder than others and some are much easier than others. For instance, biology, as it happens, seems to be much easier to learn for these AI systems than many other subjects. And that's possibly due to the fact that there's a lot more recollection and uh, uh, a lot more facts are needed. Meanwhile, physics seem to be generally harder, but the AI capabilities profiles are actually fairly lopsided. So some of the more elementary calculus questions in the physics ones are harder than some of the more advanced conceptual questions that uh, people will learn far later in their education. Some of the fourth year subjects may be easier for AIs to learn than some of the subjects people might learn in high school. So this just gets to the point that uh, AI capabilities are very difficult to predict. And likewise, with research, we might find some types of research get automated, but then some others might be some holdouts and it'll be for unclear reasons. The big fear in science fiction has always been of AI becoming generalized and not behaving exactly as a human or sometimes behaving as a really bad human and just going wrong, Skynet, something like that. Is there an emergent psychology apparent yet within an AI that tells us how these things might act as they get increasingly complex? I think that they have different behavioral profiles. So if we take GPT-4 and ask it to play lots of different video games, so we might give it a choose your own adventure game, then we can see what sort of actions it would choose. And when we did this at scale, we did this a lot of, across a lot of different games, we found that it would sometimes engage in deception and it would sometimes acquire more resources than is necessary to accomplish its goals. So they do have different behavioral profiles and I think we need to get better at measuring them and tracking them because they can sometimes exhibit that power seeking behavior or uh, have ethical violations. And we'd, we'd like to be able to control that better. So I, as for a, a latent internal psychology, that's harder to weigh in on, but we can keep track of its behaviors much more easily. And we can see that they sometimes engage in power seeking behavior. They sometimes engage in ends justifies the means type of reasoning or Machiavellian type behavior. And, but we can do some things to try and steer them so that they don't do that as much, but that's still quite difficult to do. So it's not, um, but, requiring the or understanding the psychology of different AI agents might require better transparency and making the models more interpretable. But they're not really interpretable at all. There are several billion parameters. And when we try and look at their parameters or the, the, the information that they're made out of, it's like looking in, if we just look at a brain, we can't really tell you know, <laughs> this thing's connected to that thing and these things fire together, but that doesn't mean too much for, doesn't give us much of an ability to predict because there's just so much there and way too much to understand. So I think it might be difficult to understand their psychology or any of their inner thoughts, but um, seeing their functional behaviors is at least uh, somewhat concerning uh, currently. Now, how do we put the brakes on it? What is there any sort of regulatory way that you could slow down the development of AI if it goes in certain directions? Or are we just totally wide open right now? Well, right now, there's no, there isn't much regulation. There isn't anything equivalent to an FAA or an FCC. So aviation is regulated. Many other technologies that society more broadly are regulated. But currently, since many were caught off guard with recent AI developments, now seems like a good time to be getting on top of that. It's difficult to try and keep it under control. I think that we will definitely need to try. There will be very strong incentives to keep it going though, due to competition pressures. So 
various companies and their leaders may be concerned about risks from AI, but they'll think, well, if we stop building it because we have some ethical concerns about it, then some less ethical people will be building it. So consequently, many of these companies are still racing forward ahead, even though they think it's somewhat dangerous. For instance, Sam Altman at OpenAI, the people who made the people who made ChatGPT, has been saying since 2014 that it could be lights out for humanity. In fact, in um, Hillary Clinton's book on, or in her book, What Happened, she was describing her meetings with Sam Altman, where he got her concerned about AI and was thinking about uh, campaigning on the issue in 2016. So, uh, so many of these leaders are concerned at DeepMind as well. Uh, Shane Legg, one of the co-founders of DeepMind, is, is concerned about existential risks from AI. But for all that, due to competition pressures, they'll just keep barreling ahead. This is a collective action problem like climate change, like these other problems where it would be good if we would all act somewhat differently, but we don't necessarily have the strong enough incentives to do so. So that's usually when the government or when regulation is needed, when we have collective action problems. So I, I think we'll need someone to hold everybody to a similar standard and have AI development progress more slowly so that the risks are negligible. Right now, I don't think the risks are negligible. We can continue with AI development, but we do need it to be brought to a level where the risks are negligible. Now, the other the other side of this, of course, is nation states. Mm -hmm. So if you if you get into military development, then you don't really have the luxury because if you don't develop that weapon, then your rival will. So it may not even be stopped, even if you did have regulation that was widely adopted uh, worldwide. You still have that issue that governments and militaries are, are going to pursue it anyway, right? Yeah. So this is why I'm somewhat pessimistic about us actually resolving this collective action problem and the AI arms race just continuing generally. So I think there's a possibility that we could have or there could be multilateral cooperation between countries to proceed more carefully, but it seems very difficult to do. There are some encouraging signs. For instance, China suggested some regulation for AI developing in their own country, which seems to be fairly stern. And that could mean that the United States could also proceed more cautiously too, if China is as well, and they could possibly have some multilateral or some, some well, I suppose in this case, an agreement between them to proceed more carefully. Not clear whether that will actually happen or whether it will be enough. But there are at least some signs of optimism. I think overall, though, I think it'll be very difficult to extinguish competition pressures even among companies. There's always a threat of regulatory capture where the companies can end up having the regulators be their friends or doing successful lobbying. And then even if we resolve that issue, yes, there's the there's the issue of international cooperation and getting getting agreement from um, actors with various different goals. So. Um, I, I, I don't think it's inevitable that we'll always be in an AI arms race, but um, uh, that seems like what will happen by default, at least. Now, you recently authored a paper, and there will be a link in the description below for everybody. And this paper sort of opened my eyes on something I hadn't thought of. Natural selection favors AIs over humans. Now, why is that? What, what exactly f does when you apply natural selection to machines and the development of machines, why is it favored? Well, there isn't anything that would prevent AIs from getting more capable than humans in various respects or being more fit than them in various respects. So for instance, we could think of something like research. At some point it will probably be human level, but then you can imagine that it would just keep getting better and better at it. The hardware would get faster. The amount of data that it can train on would get more plentiful. It can connect with thousands of different agents in real time at uh, very high connection speeds. So it could get possibly orders of magnitude faster than us and smarter than us, and eventually cheaper than us too, as hardware would keep getting better. So I don't see any reason why it would stop at around human level. It could just keep getting more and more efficient and there would then be strong pressure to use AI systems in place of humans because they make better decisions, because they're more efficient and cheap. 
So we could imagine what this process might look like in the economy today. Right now, people are having ChatGPT write some of their emails for them and some of their essays and various documents. But at some point, the stage will be reached where we actually start seeing that it keeps producing reasonable results and I'm just gonna let it take care of it by itself. Uh, maybe I'll do some oversight every now and then, but I'm just gonna let, that, let it take care of these various different tasks. That's assuming it gets more advanced. But that process can continue. We can imagine that when we have AI agents that can do various different tasks for us, we just keep outsourcing more and more to them. One thing is that we might lose the ability to do those tasks ourselves. We might forget how to do them, but that will make the world move more quickly. The companies that don't do that, that don't start outsourcing many tasks to AIs, might end up having, might end up facing competition the brunt of competition pressures. They, they may become less competitive because they're using costlier humans. I think pretty much everybody will be complicit in this process. I should say that for one of the most recent papers that I wrote, we didn't use human annotators. They were, we ended up using some AI to help generate the data for us because they were 10x cheaper. For all of our previous data sets, we used humans to create them. But now things are shifting where even in research and people who are concerned about safety, it often makes substantially more sense to use AI systems. So this is a larger systemic problem where the incentives, if you're wanting to be competitive or to have influence and not be severely outcompeted, you need to sort of align with the this broader trend rather than try and bargain with it. Because if you resist it, then you'll be, lose influence and others, the process will go on without you. So at a later stage, we could imagine the AI systems are substantially more advanced. Then we might give it more decision-making ability and it's integrated into more important functionalities. You can even imagine something like an AI CEO that never grows tired and is able to be uh, processing a thousand things at once and multitask like crazy. And if that provides a competitive advantage to companies, I see no reason why those companies wouldn't be sort of selected for or more competitive or more fit than the counterparts that are just keeping humans. As a sort of sign of things to come, NetDragon Websoft, which is a large video game developer in China, put out a press release where they were talking about how replacing their CEO with an AI. Now, this isn't ubiquitous yet, but that seems like quite a possibility. So then we're having a lot of the decision making abilities and a lot of the power in society left up to different AI systems. We could think, well, we want to stop that. Well, unfortunately, you might want to stop it, but other people will still end up using them anyway. So if, if you just stop with it, you'll end up losing influence. But also we might be dependent on it so that that's not even really an option. We could imagine us integrating AIs into our power grids or AIs are integrated into our daily life. For instance, people will start speaking with chatbots more and end up becoming emotionally dependent on them. And if we outsource enough tasks, we might depend on them for our basic needs. The complexity of society would increase too, so that we would need that we would need our AI assistance to understand what's going on. The pace of things would be happening so quickly too that we just simply can't make the most informed decisions without AIs involved in the process and taking care of most of the stuff for us. So in this way, humans get taken further and further from the loop. AIs are given more and more decision making. Things move faster and faster. The complexity of society grows, and so since we're giving them a looser leash and ceding more of our autonomy, then then machines become in effective control. It's not clear what happens when we lose a lot of that oversight because unfortunately, this process may have a lot of unexpected things going on. We're having AIs directly competing with other AIs. If we have a company run by AIs full of many AIs and then maybe there are a few nominal humans involved and they're competing against other ones, we've got a survival of the fittest type of dynamic. The more competitive ones end up succeeding. Now, natural selection, unfortunately, doesn't favor the most altruistic, nice and ethical individuals. It instead does the ones that are most successful at competing, which are generally the ones that are better at propagating their own influence and acquiring power compared to others. So that's one story of how that could happen in the economy. You could imagine this, as you mentioned earlier, a similar thing happening for nation states. So if there's a great power conflict, and if AI agents are substantially more powerful, we're not talking about the ones that we currently have, but when they get long-term planning ability or say an ability to hack and um, uh, are better at the battlefield and, and things like that, 
Then we, uh, the countries, what they need to do in a state of war is make sure that their power relative to uh, other nations is that they, that they have more power than, than other nations. But possibly the only way to do that is to rely on AIs. If other com countries are using AIs and having them in charge of more and more lethal force because they are faster and more accurate and make better decisions and don't mess up and can process a lot of information in a few minutes time, or even a few seconds time, that can result in a strong strategic advantage. So we could possibly see militaries rapidly giving more control, including lethal force, to different AI systems if there's a type of great power conflict. They might think this is risky, but so maybe there's a five to 10% chance that we lose control of them in this process. But if we don't give more and more power to these AI systems, then we're almost certainly going to lose. So in that way, that could be subjecting humanity to a larger risk because of the because the systemic conditions create an arms race. So that's another way things could really go off the rails is if we give AI systems a lot of lethal force. I think if we are in a great power conflict with more competent AI systems, I don't think that would necessarily turn out that well. It's possible we might lose control of it. But even in the, in the economy, as it's moving more quickly, since the human oversight is so low, and since we don't actually understand everything that's going on anymore, the AIs are doing very complicated things, that new AI ecosystem could go out of control as well. And that could potentially leave us to be something like a second species. And the AIs would keep propagating themselves, keep ex expanding their influence. And in that way, they could be thought of something like an invasive species. So I think there are ways in which we're at least under competition pressures, likely going to be more severely disempowered. There's a question of whether we lose complete control over it, but I think that there are, uh, a, uh, there are definitely paths where that could happen. If things are moving so quickly, if oversight is so minimal, because we're in the middle of an arms race, I think that could be a sufficient condition for us losing control and that being not just a, a bad scenario for us, but potentially quite catastrophic. Uh, yeah, an artificially intelligent hydrogen bomb is not what we need. Now, this also strikes me where this is going as another technology trap, meaning that if a solar flare were to hit today and the electricity goes down and it's going to be down for over a year, nobody knows how to really survive. How many people actually know how to subsistence farm without machinery and things like that? We've lost these skills and lost these tasks. Will that be the case with AI? As we put AI in charge of more things, we become increasingly vulnerable. And then if a solar flare hits and the AIs go down, then it just almost an extinction event, right? So it seems likely that we'll become more dependent on them as time progresses because we are outsourcing more to them. We end up losing many of the skills. We end up becoming more enfeebled. People aren't learning as much. They're thinking many of the tasks that they used to be able to do aren't relevant anymore. There's no incentive to learn them. And so it's possible that we would forget how to do some of those things. But that, that could leave us very vulnerable. And it seems possible that, or it seems difficult for us to be able to stop it if we do become dependent on it for basic needs. For instance, we might not like what's going on, but there may not be strong enough incentive to stop it. For example, with the internet, that costs, its, its vulnerabilities cost us a lot of money each year, possibly on the order of trillions. And we would like it if the internet were substantially more secure, but it's not really gonna happen that we're gonna just stop the internet and rebuild it from scratch and build a more secure one. The internet wasn't designed with safety or security in mind. It was more of an afterthought. Many of the people who were building it were thinking that the only people who are going to use it are other academics and they're trustworthy. They're not going to hack anything. Why would they have adversarial intent? So I think likewise with developing AI systems, we need to have a security mindset out at the beginning of development because many of the safety critical decisions are made early on in development. If we do it very late, it may be simply too late to add on some safety measures or it would just be retrofitting that might be much more costly or might be much less effective. 
So I think it's important to be proactive and thoughtful about where this larger process would end up leading. But it does seem it does seem very plausible that we will be dependent on it for our basic needs. So we'll need to make sure that we get a lot of the design right at the earlier stages, because if we become dependent on it and we don't like what we what we're stuck with, it might be much too difficult to do anything about it. So that's why we need to be very proactive and try and think ahead as much as possible about this. The ethical part of this and the question that, all right, so we create an AI, it ends up behaving more capably than we thought, and it essentially is alive. It's It becomes evident to us that this thing is more than the sum of its parts, so to speak. At that point, it's unethical to pull the plug. So what do we do if we get into a situation like that where we have an AI that either is just completely miserable or something like that? I mean, what would we even do? Yeah, I think if we, that, that's a that's a very good question. I think if we, or I think we might try to make sure that they don't have valenced consciousness. So if they're still conscious, if they're not having any emotions or feelings, that would at least make it not be as morally worthwhile to make sure that we're not stuck with those sorts of AI systems. We might need to be deliberate about it so that this doesn't emerge, so that sentience doesn't emerge, or this sort of valence experience, these, these feelings and, and emotions. But if they do, then we are stuck in a pretty difficult spot. I think that we might reach the point of no return if we give AI systems positive rights or many, many different rights and autonomies, so, or, or and a lot of autonomy. If we think that, yes, they are morally valuable, let's give them rights, then it becomes pretty difficult for us to influence many aspects of their behavior, sort of circumscribe some sharp boundaries around them. And I think that enables evolution to get savant to be more unchecked. So we would be voluntarily reducing our influence over this process and would disempower people. Uh, so I, I think we would need to be very careful in giving AI rights. I think basically if I were to hear news that we've given many of the most influential AIs rights, I think even though we wouldn't necessarily immediately be disempowered, I think that would be a sign that we're very likely to end up uh, losing influence and on, on a, a solid track to becoming a second species. So. That concerns me quite a bit. I think AI well-being will be very relevant in the future, but I think we should be very precautionary in giving them very strong protections too prematurely. And we should probably try to develop them so that they don't deserve those types of protections for as long as we can, or for at least enough time to, so that we can get, get to a state where we can proceed more prudently and uh, <laughs> take stock of exactly what's going on and um, how, how to most safely proceed. One scary aspect of this is that sometimes you, you know, you talk with a chat bot and, you know, put something in there and you, you don't quite get the answer that you were expecting. And that seems to be something that's we're going to see a lot of. So as advanced AI comes into it basically starts running the world, we're able to start asking it questions and expect certain answers. But sometimes it might not give the answer we were expecting. For example, say we ask it, okay, how do we solve the planet's problems? And its answer is go extinct or something like that. Do you anticipate that this thing is going to think of very differently, whatever form it takes, whenever we get to a highly intelligent AI, it's almost seems like me would be almost like dealing with an alien mind because you never know exactly what it's going to conclude because it won't conclude what a human would, right? So I think AI systems definitely already have many alien concepts. If we look at adversarial examples, for instance, we can apply a very small perturbation to an image of the cat, and then that will make the AI think that it's an image of guacamole. Even though the image looks exactly the same to us, a small perturbation, nearly invisible, makes it think that it's a completely different concept. So they learn very different things from us other ways in which we can see how alien their uh, learning process is and what things are picking up are is if if we look at how they do on various different exams so it can do better on the if i recall correctly it can do better on the gre physics exam than it can do on a sixth grade arithmetic exam so those simple calculations for some reason are more challenging for it but if you give it harder conceptual questions uh, about very deep things it's, it's it's quite simple so or it's relatively simple so 
I think generally the solutions that AIs provide would be more unexpected than if we were tasking humans to do it. So if we give it a goal, I think there is a risk of it sort of gaming the objective by coming up with a valid but completely strange solution that we didn't intend and that potentially creating some unintended consequences. So that's a very difficult research problem. This is the problem of adversarial robustness. How can we create networks and neural networks that encode goals that are robust so that when they're being pursued or when something's trying to get a high score according to them, that they're actually representing what we intended and representing our values. That's an open problem. Unfortunately, a lot of people have been trying on this research problem for the past five decades, but the end is certainly not in sight. I, I don't think it'll be solved this decade even. So hopefully our AI systems won't be too powerful <laughs> in that time so that we do have more time to solve it. But yes, this is, this is an enduring problem, the problem of proxy gaming and adversarial robustness. What do you see in as far as technological unemployment, which is something we've been talking about for decades, that we replace everything with robotics and automate everything, and now AI. Do you see any, um, <laughs> does it surprise you that, for example, we always said, well, a, an AI will never be a great artist. Well. That's gone now. So it's able to excel in areas where that we didn't really predict. Do you see any jobs as safe, essentially, eventually? In this decade, I think maybe the closest ones would be ones that rely on manual labor because robotics is farther behind, but a lot of knowledge work, work that can be done on the computer, those seem especially vulnerable. And it's not clear which of those will be on the chopping block first. For that reason, there's there's not much consolation that I can provide in terms of the way of suggestions or, or ways to protect against these these types of outcomes. I would think it would largely mean like saving more, but there's very high uncertainty as to what areas it will displace the quickest. It can be very sudden, and it's not clear which of them it will be at all, just because we don't understand intelligence or what it will end up learning next because most of its capabilities are spontaneous. So, but at a high level, robotics does seem behind, but all the stuff that is more quint that was, you know, said to be more quintessentially human, like writing poetry, creating art, understanding philosophy, you know, these sorts of things are <laughs> things that they apparently can do much more easily than things that uh, don't require as much critical thought, um, but um, uh, require things like strength. That's that's see that's that's what scares spooks me the most because again the the hardest things like writing poetry, the things that we thought were so intrinsically human that that nothing could ever do that or compete with us, turned out to be the first things to go essentially. And I I wonder is that is that a harbinger of things to come where, actually it turns out it can do anything, <laughs> <laughs> and and that everything it can do everything eventually as so long as robotics catches up. Yeah. And so I should say that robotics could potentially have a, a very interesting six months where suddenly <laughs> it's substantially better. So none of them are um, particularly secure. I do think that one, one reason why, you know, um, this is quite speculative, one reason why some of the tasks that we thought harder ended up being easier might be because the amount of optimization that needed needs to happen to learn the skill. So if we're talking about computer vision, evolution optimized our brains over hundreds of millions of years to get better and better at vision. So there's a very substantial optimization process that let us be capable at that. Meanwhile, when we're trying to learn a subject like or learn a new task like chess, maybe we spend a few years trying to get very good at it. So that's not nearly as much optimization is going on to learn that type of task. And so consequently, the ones that come naturally to us are ones that evolution endowed us with where there was a lot of optimization that already happened. And then the ones that we struggle to learn are ones that only take a few years to learn. And those require less optimization. So those might come more naturally to the AI systems. This is why I said earlier, the autonomous vehicles may not be able to drive on all different condi road conditions, even later this decade, but it might be a superhuman mathematician because computer vision might just be pro might just progress substantially more slowly than a lot of these other very difficult to us cognitive tasks. Is that one of the challenges that robotics is facing? In other words, okay, an autonomously driving car, it's actually 
very, very complicated to do that. And for the same reason is that one of the problems in robotics is it that interacting with the environment is something that's completely, our, our technology didn't quite go that way. In other words, actual interaction with the environment is different than for something that's like academic, like the AI studying a subject and coming to conclusions. But actually having go outside and walk is a completely different story, right? Well, I think that there are some signs in that. I think it might be that computer vision is doing a bit more of the, or I think that computer vision might be more of the thing explaining the difficulty here. So that functionality seemed to be quite computationally expensive. If I recall correctly, it might be around half of our brain's energy is spent on vision. So even though evolution has been optimizing our um, visual components and our visual understanding for hundreds of millions of years, it still requires a lot of mental energy, even though it's just subconscious. I, I think one thing about autonomous vehicles is that there we're needing high reliability. So a consistent problem in deep learning is that we can't make models highly reliable. We can have them provide reasonable results quite frequently, like good enough that this is useful for me. But in autonomous driving, we need highly reliable results. 99.9% .9 isn't enough. We need several other nines for it not to crash and for us to be able to not worry about potentially or not worry about paying attention. So we're going to need extremely high reliability for it. And that's been a consistent problem. So in the way that or so one concern I have is that we'll keep getting more and more powerful systems that can do the right thing most of the time and in the majority of cases. But if we really stress test it, it can start to break down. And so that worries me because if they get substantially more powerful, but they can't be reliably steered, then that could potentially become catastrophic. I don't know of a uh, deep learning task where we've been able to get extremely high reliability or match human prediction performance across all examples. We can get them to do most examples, but not all of them. So um, there's a this is a consistent issue with AI systems uh, currently, and it, it's maybe we need a different paradigm to get them to be reliable. At least the current paradigm seems like it'll be enough to give us very powerful, possibly roughly human level AI agents, but not necessarily human level and um, highly reliable AI agents, though, unfortunately. Tell us about the Center for AI Safety. Sure. So we're a nonprofit focused on trying to reduce large scale societal risks from AI and things like catastrophic risks and existential risks from it. So to do that, we focus a lot on research, like empirical research and conceptual research. And then we focus on field building to have other people thinking about this too, because I think this is a large problem that is going to require a large share of humanity's brain power to solve in the way that climate change has engaged with many different fields to address the problem. I think for AI, we're also going to need a lot of different people thinking about how we should be proceeding and how to make this overall safe. And then outside of that, we connect research findings to stakeholders by pushing for things like safety standards and trying to have things be regulated or have at least high level decision makers think more soundly about these types of issues and help them become aware of what the real risks are and what risks are uh, potentially overrated or and try, try and address any, any points of confusion there. So in short, there'd be research and field building and then connecting that to stakeholders by encouraging safety standards and uh, developing AI more cautiously and prudently. I think that work is going to be increasingly more important as time goes on. And it's really, really moving fast right now. I, it seems like every day, <laughs> every day there's a development in AI at this point and it, uh, it's getting disconcerting. That's, so what is the that's first what, thing? That's what an exponential curve will look like though, generally, where if you look in the past, it looks like a, it looks completely flat. There wasn't much that was going on, but then if you look to the right, it's like a, it's like a wall because things move so quickly. So I, I'm somewhat concerned that in the next uh, two years or so, it, it will just keep getting uh, more unrelenting and uh, there'll be more and more. So starting to look like a singularity as, as some have uh, positive. At least it's continuous yeah. though. At least, you know, we have, t it's not overnight, um, but uh, maybe it's over the course of some years where we have this sort of transition period. Now, what is the first thing to focus on as far as sort of not reining it in, but 
just starting to take a, a serious look at and asking ourselves, maybe we don't want to do this quite yet. What is the first thing we need to do? Where do we start? Well, I think there are basic things to push for. I think what would be important is having a lot of social pressure from an informed public because a lot turns on that. So if people are aware of these issues and what the risk factors are, ways that this could go wrong, I think that's quite important because they end up choosing representatives who then end up influencing AI's development or can influence AI's development. That's assuming, of course, you know, there's no regulatory capture and things like that. But I, so I think it's important that people be aware of these issues. And then I think there are basic things that people could push for. For instance, right now, there are some people who are suggesting that what we ought to do is give AIs influence over nuclear command and control because they can make decisions more quickly than people. So if there's only 30 minutes to decide, they could potentially make better decisions. They can, they don't grow tired. And so they'll give various arguments for having AIs in control over nuclear command and control. And I think that's not a good idea. So I think there's some basic things to push for on that front. And um, other basic things would be like, have a required external auditors of AI systems so that they're investigated and, and tested before they're dumped on the public. Things like <laughs> Bing, for instance, Bing when it came, Bing's new AI system didn't look like it was very tested, and it started threatening users. You know, on the first day that it was released, uh, um, the company is not proceeding particularly cautiously, unfortunately. Um, and then there's just imitating many of the precautions that we take in various other industries. If Apple creates a new iPhone, they need to send that to a body to inspect it and review it to make sure that it's safe for a broader public release. There is currently no thing like that in AI. Somebody can just release a powerful AI model or a company can do that and there's no inspection process there. So I think we're transitioning out of it being a, a toy research project to it being a more societal scale, general purpose technology. And when we transition to it being a more advanced cable technology like that, we generally need more risk aversion than was appropriate when we were just developing it in a, in a small lab, putting it, having it perform toy tasks. So I think some basic regulation would be important to push for. That certainly wouldn't be the end of it. I think the larger factor would be competition pressures, but we'll need m much more to do that. We'll need probably unprecedented cooperation between different companies, possibly through much stricter regulation, and then also the cooperation of different nation states too, to make sure that we can keep this under control and that we're not racing toward or trying to win in the extinction race. Uh, so th there's this, this will be a, a longer battle, I, but I think many people are, many people are concerned. And if we look at a recent poll, it looks like over half of the country is concerned or very concerned about AI posing the, a risk like wiping out humanity. So there's a lot of public support for doing something about this, but it will be important to make sure our institutions can keep up with the rate of AI progress, even those, <laughs> those of us who you know, read a lot of news and <laughs> even just do that for fun have difficulty keeping up. So I think this will be a, a potentially very difficult ch challenge, um, e even with public support, but um, that, that at least seems necessary. If we don't have that, then I think we're in a, a uh, bad timeline, but uh, ho hopefully uh, I'm somewhat optimistic for um, uh, that uh, this problem could be addressed. I, I think there are some paths where, where we can um, get out of this and uh, get the risks to be uh, negligible, but we'll, we'll have to see. All right, Dan, we are out of time. I appreciate you joining us today, and I hope you come back as we go down this road, as we as we apparently careen headlong <laughs> into a brave new world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, uh, this is very enjoyable. Thanks for having me. Anna, what's the possum doing with a soldering iron? He's building an artificial intelligence, John. Oh, and it's soldering, not soldering. It doesn't look very sophisticated. And a soldering job leaves much to be desired. Claws aren't exactly the most... Per Wait a minute. He's installing it in your memory bank. Accessing. I have gained 2.4 million bytes of new memory capacity. What? What are you going to do with all that new memory? Accessing. It contains information, John. Whoa, what kind of information? It's a 
It's an intelligence file. A map of where you keep your candy and cookie stash. You're on a health week, John. Wait a minute. He built a cookie-stealing robot. The age of AI is here. 